Hello and good morning, afternoon, or night. I'm Josh Wolper, a fourth year PhD student at the University of Pennsylvania, and I have the pleasure today of introducing to you NISO MPM, our new approach for animating anisotropic fracture. So, MPM has widely shown success as a powerful technique for simulating a breadth of complex multiphysics phenomena due both to its natural and robust collision handling, as well as its intrinsic facilitation of multimaterial coupling. And MPM just keeps getting better and better at coupling and contact through, for example, recent works like this year's IQ MPM. However, due to MPM's dependence on spatial interpolation routines, it struggles with material effects such as fracture that introduce sharp topological discontinuities. Recent approaches such as CPIC enabled cutting within MPM, but this is purely geometric with no physics behind it. Conversely, last year we introduced PFF MPM, an approach rooted in phase field fracture with rigorous physics behind it. However, PFF MPM does introduce its own problems, namely it's designed strictly for isotropic materials and can be slow and tricky to tune. As such, an ISO-MPM adopts the continuum damage mechanics focus of PFF-MPM, but seeks to support isotropic, transversely isotropic, and orthotropic materials, all while offering better speed and faster parameter setting. So, physically-based material fracture has been studied at length in graphics with great success, including meshed methods such as FEM, BEM, and XFEM, as well as meshless models such as the MPM approaches taken by CPIC and PFF-MPM. As for phase field modeling, Yang et al. introduced phase field theory to graphics to model continuous interfaces between material phases, and naturally PFF-MPM is also rooted in phase field theory. Material anisotropy has seen success in recent works, such as the BEM-based spatially varying toughness approach of Hahn and Woden, or the thin shell anisotropic fracture of Faf et al. And anisotropic elasticity has seen similar successes, such as last year's work by Kim et al., as well as the thin shell anisotropy used by Zhang et al. for MPM cloth simulation. In building an ISO MPM, we're inspired by the QR decomposition based elasticity approach for MPM cloth, as well as the continuum damage mechanics focus of PFF MPM. So, an ISO MPM is composed of three key contributions. The first is a non local continuum damage mechanics approach for anisotropic crack modeling, and this includes both an explicit and an implicit discretization. The second is a QR decomposition based anisotropic constitutive model that is inversion safe, robust to large deformations, and more efficient than SVD models. And finally, for extremely stiff fibered materials, we further introduce a novel Galerkin weak form discretization that enables embedded directional inextensibility. Now, before delving into NISO MPM, let's review some background topics, starting with MPM basics. And MPM is known as a hybrid method, meaning that it discretizes a material both as a set of particles and as a grid of nodes. And MPM uses the particles to keep track of data like velocity and position, while the grid nodes are used as a scratch pad for force computations. The core loop of MPM entails transferring data from the particle view to the grid view, and then using the grid to perform force computations and update velocities. Then these updated velocities are transferred back to the particles and used to add back to particle positions, and then this loop repeats. Next, I'll give a quick overview of continuum damage mechanics and phase field fracture. So in contrast with fracture techniques that model cracks as material discontinuities, CDM uses a smeared crack approach, also known as diffuse crack modeling, which assumes the material remains a continuum, and instead the mechanical properties of the material are weakened at the cracks to account for the effects of fracture. Within CDM, damage can be modeled either locally, such as through comparing local stresses with some defined maximal stress, or non-locally through tracking a scalar field of damage variables evolving over time. And this latter approach is known as phase field fracture, or PFF. And we focus on augmenting MPM with phase field fracture through tracking damage in the particle view and evolving damage variables on the grid, which then in turn affect the force computations. And these phase values are constrained to be between 0 and 1, with 0 being healthy material and 1 being fully damaged material. In the image at top right, the disk is considered to be a continuum in material space at left, but the phase is tracked such that in the high damage red region, we see material separation at right because the material is weakened at the crack. The damage variables further influence the material's elastic response through a method of elasto-damage coupling known as elasticity degradation. For fracture, we want to degrade the tensile elasticity to allow for material separation under tension, and we do this by multiplying a monotonic degradation function g that's based on the current damage, and notice that the rate that g goes from 1 to 0 as damage increases. Finally, I'll give a brief overview of some anisotropy terminology. Firstly, isotropic materials behave the same in every direction. Think of a simple jello cube bouncing. Its elastic response is the same regardless of direction. Second, transversely isotropic materials have an underlying structure that strengthens just one axis of the material, and we'll call this axis A1. Many biological tissues do exhibit transverse isotropy, including muscles, which allow different deformations in the longitudinal and transverse directions. And finally, orthotropic materials can define three mutually orthogonal axes that can each have different material responses. We only need to label two of these, so we add A2 to label the second axis. The most intuitive example of an orthotropic material is wood, where the underlying fibrils can change the behavior in the axial, radial, and circumferential directions. Now before delving into anisotropic damage, let's overview the NISO-MPM data flow to give some intuition about how these pieces work together. 
We start with the basic NPM data pipeline, where we transfer damage to the grid, compute forces and update velocity, and then transfer these new velocities back. And here we see that NISO NPM utilizes a staggered integration scheme and introduces a second data pipeline for damage transfer and evolution. Note that so far this is just the pipeline for explicit damage. We use the current particle deformation gradients to update damage, and then damage is used to update grid velocity through elasticity degradation. And we also present a method for evolving damage using implicit time integration using a similar data flow. And finally, note that our inextensibility solver is implemented as a hard constraint on updated grid velocity, and we show this in the momentum pipeline. And now finally, we can jump into exploring our approach to anisotropic damage. For our approach to anisotropic damage, we're inspired by the geometric approach to diffuse crack modeling. We begin with a spatially regularized crack surface functional, seen at the top, where L0 is the length scale parameter used to regularize the diffuse crack, and this gamma L0 expression is a crack surface density function that defines the crack density per unit volume. In the second row, we show the specific form of this crack surface density we used. And finally, the minimization principle of diffuse crack topology gives us an expression for the regularized crack phase field seen in the third row. Below that, you can see that W gamma is a constraining Dirichlet condition that ensures damage is maximized at the crack surface. And to give you some more intuition about this, we show it right the exponential function that is the solution to this minimization problem for various settings of L0. And as you can see, decreasing L0 decreases the spread of the diffuse crack representation. In NPM, we choose to keep L0 at a consistent setting of half the simulation grid resolution to ensure that the diffuse crack does not spread further than one grid cell. Now let's explore how we evolve damage over time. Our damage evolution is derived from the aforementioned crack density function and can be thought of as a balance between a local crack driving force and a geometric resistance to fracture. And note that the eta parameter on the left is included to control the speed of crack propagation, and the geometric resistance here is unique to our chosen crack density function and includes the damage Laplacian. Finally, as damage evolves during simulation, we must enforce what's called crack irreversibility, or simply making sure that cracks don't heal over time. More specifically, we ensure that the gradient of the crack surface functional is always positive, which gives us three constraints. Specifically, damage must be bounded between 0 and 1, local cracks may only grow, and the crack driving force should be positive. And we can further manipulate our damage evolution to reveal the following properties from these constraints. For a healthy state, H should be 0, and for a full damage state, H should be infinity, and lastly, H should always be increasing. And from this, we can further glean that h must be a positive, monotonically increasing function, and we satisfy this condition by defining h to be the history-dependent maximum of a generalized crack-driving state function, d tilde, as seen at the bottom. And now we must design this function to satisfy the first two constraints, since we satisfy the third with this history-dependent maximum. In our formulation, we're inspired by an anisotropic crack-driving state function that's shown success for biological tissues. The exact form of d tilde is shown at the top, where we introduce some new symbols. Zeta controls the slope of the driving force, but we kept this to be 1 to further reduce the parameter space. The brackets are called Macaulay brackets and preserve positive values while flattening all negative values to 0, as you can see in the graph at right. And finally, sigma plus is the tensile portion of Cauchy's stress and is computed using the Cauchy eigenvalues and eigenvectors, as you can see in the second row. Next, we define an expression phi as a function of the tensile stress seen in the third row. We introduce here the notion of a critical stress, sigma c, that dictates how much stress a material can withstand before fracturing. And most important of all, in the fourth row, we show the second order tensor A, which is a structural tensor that encodes the material's intrinsic fiber directions. Recall that A1 and A2 are the fiber directions, and we construct this tensor by adding contributions from each of these directions to the identity matrix using the alpha parameters to weight these contributions. These alphas give us great control over the type of anisotropy. For example, a material can be changed from orthotropic to transversely isotropic by simply setting alpha 2 to 0, and even further made to be isotropic by also setting alpha 1 to 0. At right, we present four plots showing the behavior of our d tilde function for three different fiber orientations, as well as an isotropic material. And notice how for the 90 degree fibers, as stress increases in the fiber direction, sigma 2, d tilde stays constant, but it increases quite rapidly due to stress in the weak orthogonal direction. And conversely, for the isotropic material, it responds identically to stress in every direction. Now let's take a brief break from equations to give some intuition behind the material effects attainable through tuning our damage parameters. In the top row, we see that increasing the critical stress, sigma c, increases the material's resistance to fracturing, and in the bottom row, we show the effect of increasing eta, which dramatically slows the crack. And now back to equations. Next, let's go through how we discretize our damage evolution using NPM, starting with our explicit damage approach. We begin with our damage evolution equation, shown at the top, and as you can imagine, this is pretty simple to discretize and solve explicitly, but there are some key implementation details to be aware of. Firstly, in the second row, we show our expression for updating the damage of particle P from time n to time n plus 1, and notice that we always take the minima between this update and 1 to ensure that we keep the damage bounded. Next, note that the d tilde that we use in our damage update is actually a history-dependent maximum of all d tilde values ever seen by this particle, satisfying that history constraint, 
And finally, we must compute for each particle the damage Laplacian, which requires that we transfer damage to the grid. Next, let's look at how we implicitly discretize our damage evolution. At the top, we present our implicit damage evolution rule, and if you're familiar with CDMPM, this might already look a little familiar to you. We further write a weak form of this evolution, and then discretize it using the MLS shape function and its gradient, seen in the second row as nabla theta. And similarly to PFFMPM, we end up with a system that strongly resembles a heat equation in that we have a diagonal matrix as the first term, a Laplacian as the second, and a scalar as the right-hand side. Fortunately, this form means that we can solve this using an iterative method. And in the third row, we show the form of this discretized system, where D is the vector of unknown grid damage values, A is a diagonal matrix, B is the MPM discrete Laplace operator in terms of the MLS shape function gradient, and C is the vector of right-hand terms. In all of our main demos, we use explicit damage due to its speed, but we want to highlight where implicit damage really succeeds. Our explicit discretization includes a term where our time step is divided by eta, and as such, very small eta values will break the CFL condition for explicit damage. So we show here an example where this happens. Implicit damage is able to beautifully resolve this extremely fast crack, while explicit damage explodes as soon as the critical stress is reached. So now that you have the core framework for NISO-MPM, let's dig into our anisotropic elasticity. So as I mentioned earlier, our anisotropic elasticity draws inspiration from our earlier work on MPM cloth modeling and is rooted in the QR decomposition of the deformation gradient. Here, Q is a rotation matrix, and R is an upper triangular matrix like shown. And previously, we saw that we will write our energy density as an additive decomposition between tensile, compressive, and fiber contributions. However, before we detail that, we'll write our energy in more familiar terms. So specifically, we adopt the stable Neohookian energy density, which we break down into a shearing term, psi mu, and a volumetric term, psi lambda. And to add anisotropic behavior to our model, we further introduce a fiber term. And this fiber term itself has two terms. The first penalizes stretching in the principal fiber direction with stiffness kx, and the second penalizes stretching in the secondary direction with stiffness ky. We set kx and ky by multiplying the material's mu parameter by a fiber scale parameter, gamma. And in this way, we enable NISO-MPM to model all modes of anisotropy by simply setting these gamma values. At right, we pull on some anisotropically elastic tubes and display their cross-sections. Notice that the isotropic tube contracts the same in every direction, the transversely isotropic tube shows less compression in the principal fiber direction, and finally, the orthotropic material shows that we can further scale the secondary fiber direction for less compression in that axis. And we also find that our anisotropic constitutive model is robust to inversions and extremely large deformations, as seen by the random initialization and single-point recovery tests of the elastic gorilla at right. And excitingly, we also found that this QR approach to elasticity is over 3.4 times faster than SVD-based elasticity when computing the stress derivatives we need. Finally, let's go back to this notion of elasticity degradation. At the top, we return to the degraded energy density, including the tensile and compressive terms psi plus and psi minus. We also present the monotonic degradation function g that we use to couple damage and elasticity. Note that this includes a very small residual damage parameter r that prevents the unbounded growth of the deformation gradient when the material is fully damaged. And now let's look at how we construct the tensile and compressive energies using the shear and volumetric terms we just saw. So the tensile portion always contains the shear term and only contains the volumetric term when we have an increase in volume indicated by j greater than or equal to one. Naturally, the compressive term then is either zero for volume increase or the volumetric term for volume decrease. And recall that we only want to weaken the tensile contribution to the overall energy to allow for material fracture. So this means that we always weaken the shear term, only weaken the volumetric term for volume increase, and never weaken the fiber term. Finally, at right, we present some graphs of our anisotropic elasticity. Notice in the top chart that as damage increases from 0 to 1, the overall energy density decreases symmetrically. And in the bottom right, we show the effects of fiber scaling on the energy. Notice here the asymmetry of the transversely isotropic scaling compared with that of the orthotropic scaling. Now before we move on from elasticity, let's also take a look at the fracture effects attainable through tuning Young's modulus, or E, and the fiber scaling gamma. Notice how as we increase E, the material becomes harder and harder to fracture, and in the second row, we show in material space the cracks formed by increasing the fiber scaling. Note that as we increase gamma, the cracks become sharper and clearer. So, with the brunt of NISO-MPM covered, let's quickly go over our final contribution of directional inextensibility. So first, to give this some motivation, we show some hanging jello blocks and compare using inextensibility versus anisotropic elasticity. Within each of these pairs, the left block has fully parallel fibers, and the right block has slightly perturbed fibers. And notice that the yellow block on the right struggles to exhibit the behavior we expect due to a well-known phenomenon called locking. Further, we show here that our anisotropic elasticity struggles to model extremely stiff materials without using very small time steps. The six tori on the left have ropes modeled with elasticity, while the two on the right have inextensible ropes. And as you can see, our elasticity causes numerical fractures in the ropes carrying the heavier tori, while the inextensible ropes display very little displacement. So with that motivation in mind, let's see how our inextensibility solver works. 
We begin with the inextensibility enforcing constraint at the top, where we see the time-dependent fiber direction A, as well as the Eulerian rate of strain tensor D, as shown to the right. With this constraint in hand, we may write a constrained equation for conservation of momentum, as shown in the second row. And notice that in this equation we introduce the notion of the full stress, which includes not only our isotropic stress, sigma, but also some unknown tension along the fiber, represented in magnitude by the Lagrangian multiplier, lambda. Ultimately, our goal is to construct a system to solve for velocity v and fiber tension lambda. And we further derive a weak form of our constrained momentum equation and then discretize it using MPM to get the system in the third row. Here, M is a diagonal matrix related to mass. Both B matrices are filled with coefficients. V is a vector of unknown grid velocities and lambda is a vector of unknown tensions. This is a sparse and symmetric KKT system, but not positive definite. Fortunately, we do not need to directly solve this system, and instead we notice that we can eliminate V and end up with the system at the bottom, which can be more easily solved for lambda with iterative solvers like CG and AMGCL. And finally, with lambda in hand, we can solve for the constrained and updated grid velocities. So now that you've seen every piece of NISO MPM, let's look at some results. Here we pull on four tubes with 45 degree fibers, each with a different combination of damage and elasticity. We see here the strength of coupling anisotropic damage with anisotropic elasticity, as using only one or the other method can lead to weakly guided fracture, like on the bottom left, or uncontrollable numerical fracture, like on the bottom right. Here we smash a hollow isotropic tube and color the crack surfaces yellow. Next, we make this tube anisotropic by adding vertical fibers for transverse isotropy. Notice the clear splitting we get along the fibers now. Next, we want to peel apart the layers of a piece of Dongpo pork belly using different anisotropic settings. First, we try isotropy, but clearly this only allows us to tear a small piece away. Next, we add flat diagonal fibers to enable transverse isotropy, and now we're at least able to peel away a strip of the meat. Finally, we add a secondary fiber direction to model orthotropy, and can now peel apart the individual layers. We also color the particle damage in the top right to visualize the evolving planar crack. Next, we're inspired by the flow fiber generation of Saito et al. 2015, and simulate water flowing through this fish to generate the contoured fibers you see at the right. And notice how as we skin the fish, the fracture nicely follows this curvature. Next, we demonstrate an ISO MPM seamless pairing with plasticity as we break this little plastic heart. Next, we demonstrate a real-world example by simulating some bone fractures. Twisting produces a spiral fracture, pulling causes a transverse fracture, and bending creates an oblique fracture. Next, we pierce this poor armadillo with a giant lance while it's held in place by elastic ropes. In this first run, the armadillo uses full anisotropic damage, while the ropes use anisotropic elasticity but no damage, and notice the nice, clean, and slightly gruesome fracture down the middle. This time, the armadillo has isotropic damage, and we see that this causes the lance to simply push through the center with no directed crack at all. Finally, we rerun the anisotropic armadillo, but with inextensible ropes to show the successful pairing of anisotropic damage with inextensibility in the same simulation. Lastly, let's look at some food demos. This transversely isotropic string cheese is pulled in eight directions to partially peel apart the stringy fibers intrinsic to a pulled cheese like mozzarella. Next, this orange is simulated with radial fibers, each exhibiting local transverse isotropy. And here we show the damage. Finally, we tear apart some meat using isotropic damage first. And notice how without any fiber structure, we just pull out a plug-shaped chunk. Of course, when we do add anisotropic damage, we get the characteristic tearing along the grain of the meat that we want. And here we again show the damage. So now that we've seen the best of NISO MPM, let's go over some limitations. The first is that with NISO MPM's extreme flexibility also comes a potentially overwhelming level of artistic control. We've tried to keep this parameter space tractable by keeping parameters like L0 and zeta to be constant, but we still have at least five material parameters, three modes of anisotropy, two damage discretizations, and sometimes a demo even ends up looking better with isotropic elasticity. But for example, the bone and orange demos both pair isotropic elasticity with anisotropic damage. Fortunately, the speed afforded to us by using explicit damage makes tuning much, much easier. However, there are naturally some CFL-related limitations on using our explicit damage, including on how small we can make eta, but for faster cracks, our implicit damage offers a great solution, but in practice it is slower than explicit damage and definitely harder to implement. So now let's compare NISO MPM with CD MPM to see how we've improved on last year. Most notably, NISO MPM models not only isotropic fracture, but also various modes of anisotropic fracture as well, and excitingly, we also introduce an explicit damage discretization for significant computational improvements. As you can see in the graph at right, implicit NISO MPM is slightly faster than PFF MPM, but even better, explicit NISO MPM gives significant speedups, and as we see in the breakdown, it adds very little computational overhead to the MPM pipeline. So in summary, our explicit damage is fast and easy to implement, making artistic control easier, but it does have limitations on time step and crack speed due to the CFL condition. Conversely, our implicit damage can handle small time steps and fast cracks, but it's harder to implement. But overall, our damage pairs well with plasticity, models both isotropy and anisotropy, has myriad knobs to turn for artistic control, but is limited to just ductal fractures. 
More specifically, while NISO MPM completely eclipses the success of PFF MPM, it cannot produce the type of debris laden fractures produced by CD MPM's non associative cam clay plasticity approach to fracture. As for our QR based elasticity, we find that it's over 3.4 times faster than SVD based elasticity, models both isotropy and anisotropy, is robust to inversions and large deformations, but does suffer from the classic locking problem. And finally, our inextensibility adds support for extremely stiff materials while avoiding the locking problem, but is hard to implement and can be slow, depending on the solver. So thank you so much for listening and for your interest in NISO MPM. We'll be releasing source code in the near future, but until then, you can check out the project page for the tech doc, which does include a pseudocode. And with that, see you at the Q&A.